Welcome everyone to this episode of the Tiny Fit Diva podcast. I'm your host, Kylie Terhune, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. It's my job to help you uncover the hidden causes of chronic illness in your life so that you can achieve optimum health. And today I'm super excited to bring you Katie Kimball, who focuses on healthy kids and getting them to help you cook in the kitchen and love healthy food. And that's such a huge, huge, huge thing. So Katie, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy that you are here. Thank you so much. It's all about starting kids out healthy now. And I know you see a lot of people who are hurting and who are suffering and we all want to prevent our kids from experiencing that, right? So we've got to start them out on the right foot with nutrition. Oh, 100%. I'm going to give a short little intro so people know where you're coming from. Uh, Katie Kimball is a Michigan mom of four kids and a founder of the Kids Cook Real Foods eCourse. She has shared her journey to real food and natural living for nine years at Kitchen Stewardship, a blog that helps families stay healthy without going crazy. The video eCourse for kids serves over 6,500 families from six continents, and Katie's wisdom on getting kids to eat healthy foods is sought after by many. And like I said, I'm super excited to have you because... I work with a lot of women and one of the biggest excuses, and I'm going to call it an excuse, is their kids. And they say, I can't get my kids to eat healthy or my kids whine when I make this healthy change and I make dinner for myself and they won't eat it. So I am super excited to hear some of your tips today and uh, so we can share uh, with, with others how they can make this work in their family. So before we do that, though, tell us a little bit about you. What, what's your journey been like? How did you end up starting this and, and getting here and writing on the blog? Sure thing. Well, my background professionally is a, that of a teacher. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. It's just one of my gifts is to like take in information, digest it, and present it in a way that anyone can understand. So that was an easy choice for me as a profession. Um, I taught for a couple years in elementary school and then started a family. And when I did that is when the hamburger helper lifestyle became not as congruent with what I wanted for my child. Like that's, I think that's most people, a lot of people's like aha moment, right? Like what we put in our mouths actually matters and now it matters doubly. And so that was the beginning of my journey to kind of real food. And then I did, um, I have a blog at kitchenstewardship.com where my mission there is to help families stay healthy without going crazy. Because as I was getting into this like more healthy living journey, I talked to a lot of other moms around me and it was always this tension like, oh, when I try to be healthy, it costs more money or it takes more time or how do I, you know, help the environment and my family. Um, And so I try to help people find the habits and techniques that are in the middle that can save you time and money that can be healthy and help the environment and all that stuff. Um, so as I was doing that for a number of years, I, I heard over and over kind of like you said, moms say, well, I, I really want to get healthy, but I don't know how to cook. So it's really hard. Like I was never taught to cook. I hear that all the time. I was never taught to cook. And I thought, you know, if we don't, teach the next generation. And these moms, they're not ready to teach the next generation because they're still uncomfortable in the kitchen, right? And I thought if we don't go down and teach the next generation, 20 years from now, people will be saying, oh, I want to get healthy, but I've never taught to cook, you know? So we've got to close that gap. And I thought, I'm, I'm a teacher. I've got four kids. Like, I know, you know, I know how to impart knowledge to people. We've got to help moms teach their kids to cook. So that's where Kids Cook Real Food kind of grew out of that need that I saw. That is so amazing. I think it's it's so great when people are able to identify a need and then you have the skill set and you're just like, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to do this. And it, you know, maybe starts out small and then grows and grows and grows and you end up helping so many people through something that, you know, you just recognize as a need, which is super cool. Um, so it's one thing to say, hey, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I see this need. I'm going to teach other moms how to cook in general. But what made you uh, really, you sort of answered this, but what made you really want to get the kids involved? You just really kind of wanted to skip that, uh, that excuse, I guess, of I don't know how to cook, so you wanted to touch the other generation. But um, how did you sort of jump from let, let me help the mom to let me help the kids? Yeah, I mean, health is the whole family, right? And so if we can make this fun for kids, I think if kids get involved with food, they are so much more likely 
to eat good foods, they're so much more likely to own it and to kind of, you know, absorb into themselves the importance of eating healthy. When they do that, now we're going to be sending young adults into the world for whom health is important and they actually know how to do it, right? I always say, I don't want my kids to eat healthy for 18 years and then be left afloat without a paddle. Okay, so I have to send them into the world with the knowledge and the capabilities to make their own, you know, actual real food meals to shop in the produce section instead of the non-perishables. And, and so in order to do that, I've got to start young. Like, I can't wait until they're 16 and 17 because they will not like me. They will not want to spend time with me then. <laughs> so it's like starting now with these good habits. I love that. So it, you're really taking their age right now as a benefit and not a hindrance. And you're saying, hey, they're young enough that they want to hang out with me. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to utilize this <laughs> as opposed to, oh, my kids are too young. They don't need to know this information right now. That's so, so smart because you're so right. When you, you try to make a lot of these changes when they're in high school, it's so hard. But if you get them really, you know, start training them in, in healthy eating and how to cook when they're young, I mean, it, it just becomes part of their lifestyle. And what you do, they typically want to do so engaging them in that that's awesome so what do you think um what are some of the biggest obstacles that people face when they try to get their kids to eat healthy especially if it was maybe maybe not something that they started off really young maybe maybe they're starting when their kids are a little bit older for sure i mean you touched on it in the intro the whiny kids and the power struggles right like we are parenting all day long and it can be exhausting we've got to get them to do their homework we got to get them to flush the toilet get dressed like <laughs> these are these ridiculous things that i'm arguing with like my three-year-old and my seven-year-old about on a daily basis like yes yes actually you do have to get dressed again i know it's a tragedy right the sun it, came up again so you gotta get dressed again <laughs> it's crazy the things that they make into power struggles and it's so exhausting so to have one more thing, especially at the end of the day when you're running out of energy and out of good decision-making power, to have this dinner that you, you know, put your heart into making and then you serve it and you get what? You get the whinies, you get the, I don't like this. And, and as a mom, like there's such a tension there because you're thinking, okay, like I can be a good parent and just be hard on them, right? But is it being a good parent, like feeding them? I can't make them go hungry. So there's a ton of like emotions in the, all in this power struggle. And I think that's really, really difficult for parents to overcome, but it can be done. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's such a good point. And I've, I've touched briefly on this in some other videos and I'm sure some other podcasts that we've done too, but that whole, um, my kid is going to make this a struggle and therefore I'm going to compromise on my values and give in concept is such a tightrope to walk. Um, especially when it's not your family and you're trying to advise people, on, you know, cause they're so afraid of like, my kid's going to cry. She's going to skip dinner. And we're in this mentality where skipping a meal is such a bad thing. <laughs> like they're not going to starve. I promise you, your kids will eat when they're hungry. They will eat when they're hungry. <laughs> and, almost all of them. There's a very them. select few that won't. Right. That's a special case right as long as you have the healthy options out there and available as soon as they get hungry they'll accept it you know so just just place them out where they can have them and eventually they'll come come to feed I promise but um so uh do you find that it's a little difficult though I mean it do you think that some parents are like I'd rather just make the food and give it to them versus involving the kids. Do you think sometimes it's a little more difficult in terms of like, well, it takes a long time or I have to teach, which, which takes a lot of effort or the kids are really messy, which means I'm going to have to clean up more. For sure. Those are the same excuses I hear all the time from parents and it, it is hard. Like nobody wants to slow down, especially when you're pressured, you know, you might have soccer practice at six if dinner's not at five 30, it is literally a disaster, right? So like you can't slow down sometimes, which is why I tell parents it's so important to be intentional about teaching those skills. Like the moment at 5.15 or whatever, it, when the child says, mom, can I help? Ah, like that's the moment where we must be able to say yes, because if we constantly push them out of the kitchen, what are they going to think as they grow? I don't belong in the kitchen. This is not my place. I can't help. Okay, so we have to let them in, but... We can't if they don't know what they're doing at that moment. So we have to be intentional about teaching them cooking skills and kitchen skills at times outside time pressured areas, right? So Saturday, right after lunch, 
in the summer, right after breakfast, right after snack, when they're well fed, they're, you know, they're not hungry, there's no time pressure to get a meal on the table, that's when you can teach them how to use a sharp knife. I mean, my seven-year-old, just he just turned seven, he's a second grader, and he decided to take an apple for his lunch this morning, and I was like, do you want it cut or whole? He's like, cut, I'll do it. Nice. I didn't even I didn't even know he knew how to do apples. I think his sister taught him, which is which is the trickle down effect, by the way. When you have kids and you train the top ones right, they tend to trickle down to the lower ones. That's a tip from a mom of four. That's amazing. So he yeah, he cut this apple by himself with a paring knife and I just kept checking, making sure he was being safe. He did an amazing job. Now could he have done that if he'd asked for a cut apple and can I do it and he would had never been trained? No, it's before school time. Right. So if we can teach our kids lots of basic skills outside time pressured areas, then when they ask to help, you can say yes, because they have the skills to use. And when you're time pressured, like when I'm like really in a bind and I'm like, oh, my gosh, my main course is almost done. We have to eat right now. I don't have anything for a salad or cut veggies. Like we always start a meal with raw vegetables here. And I'll be like, OK, kids like you do carrots, you do cucumbers, you wash the cherry tomatoes, whatever they can help quickly be only because they've been trained. So that's the key is find times outside of the pressure times to, to, to slow down because you can, and they can make a mess then because you have time to clean it up. Yeah, that's super smart. And when you're talking about the different, um, the ages and thing that brought up another question for me. So I'm sure there are certain age related activities that are, or are not appropriate. Like you're talking about using a knife to cut an apple and things like that. So where would you really start kids out? Like what would be the, some of the baseline techniques or things that you would teach them in order to help you in the kitchen, but still in a safe way when they're really young? Sure. So in our course, we have three levels, beginner, intermediate, advanced. So we do kind of little kids, five and under medium sized kids who can read and older kids who already have some of the skills that they need. Mm -hmm. And so for the little kids, we do things like proper measuring. We do pouring, which is a really good small motor control skill. Just so, and then, and that gives them an empowerment at age two, again, 18 months to two, they, sh they can pour their own milk on their cereal. It might not be perfect, but the pride on their face, that's where it's perfect. Right. And they're so excited to help anything you can do to keep that intrinsic motivation that those two, three and four year olds have to help. Anything you can do to continue to build that instead of squashing it down is going to radically improve your chances of having an eight, nine, and 10 year old who not only can help, but want to. And then you don't have the power struggles, at least about, you know, the helping out and the doing the chores. So we do, we do pouring, measuring, we start them with the butter knife. We teach our little tiny ones the exact same techniques with a butter knife as we do with a chef's knife, right? So that they get those hand motions down, and by the time they're ready, it, it just depends on your child's maturity. I'd say age five, six, or seven, you can start giving them a short paring knife, a sharp knife, but you're comfortable and they're comfortable because they've been using a knife already for two or three years, right? They know where to put their hands and how to keep their fingers safe. So there's actually a lot that kids can do at young ages. I mean, there's a lot more too, but those are some of the bigger you know, kind of big idea categories that kids can do a lot more than dumping and stirring, which is what a, lot, a ton of parents do. I mean, it's great. It's great. Come into the kitchen, help me bake cookies, help me bake bread. What do we let our kids do here? I measured this, you dump it, right? And let's stir. Oh, you're stirring too hard. You're making a mess. Let me help you, right? That's kind of the story of American culture, but kids can do so much more if we can get over ourselves a little bit right. and slow down and let them make a little bit of a mess in the interest of the long game, in the interest of what they can do, you know, with those skills as they grow. And that's where what you were talking about earlier with the time sensitive moments, maybe that's not the right uh, time to be letting them do things, but on the weekends where you can relax and it's okay if you spill a little bit, cause I can clean up and we're, we're not having company over in five minutes. <laughs> and yes. that way you can kind of really relax and make it more of an enjoyable experience for sure for, for both of you. Exactly. Any new skill needs to be at an intentional time where time doesn't matter. And then they can help when time does matter. It's, it's a very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So what kind of payoff do you see from kids starting really young in the kitchen and learning how to help their mom and being more independent and being able to even cook or prep their own food and their lunches? What kind of benefits do you see with kids kind of jumping in there and getting it done? 
You know, I think if we turned your question around and said to any mom, hey, would you like it if your kid could cook or prep their own food and make their own lunches and help in the kitchen? They'd be like, yep. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, the <benefit> right there. <laughs> that's totally the benefit. There are more though. There are more. What I see in the kitchen is an incredible opportunity for us to build authentic self-esteem. That's a big buzzword in our culture, right? How, how do we not crush our children's self-esteem? How do we build their self-esteem? You know what? You don't build self-esteem by saying good job all the time. You don't build self-esteem by giving them easy things to do, right? You build self-esteem and self-confidence by giving a child something that's authentic, that people need, hello, we need to eat, right? Allowing them to see a challenge that might be tricky to meet that challenge and to use that to serve others. The, the look on a child's face when they can make food, even if it's just for, you know, dad or mom coming home from work, but especially if you can do it when you're having company or going to a party or a potluck and you can say, oh, you know, my five-year-old made that dip. Oh my gosh, the look on their face, better than any glittery craft, right? It's better, it's better than getting your soccer medal for participation. <laughs> but I, the, the amount of confidence and self-esteem that being able to cook something and work with food builds in kids is immeasurable and priceless. That's awesome. Yeah, teaching, what you're saying basically is, you know, teaching them hard things is what builds our self-confidence. I mean, mm -hmm. they have to be able to, you know, real life application and I can solve this problem and I can take this challenge and I know how to do this for myself and, you have a real world application for a skill. It's pretty cool. So what yeah. about parents? Um, you know, to, if, if you had talked about, you know, a lot of the need came from parents are like, Hey, I was never taught how to cook. So can parents take your class? Do they learn a lot from these classes as well? That's a great question. A lot of parents tend to say things like, Shh, don't tell I'm learning to cook too. <laughs> um, and even, I mean, I, I get emails and reviews, even from people who are good cooks, they say, gosh, I've learned a few things too. Cause most of us kind of learned as we went, you know, we, we just randomly built our skills like a trailer home that has rooms added to it here and there. And it's all a little bit messy. Um, so yes, definitely whole families can learn using the class. It's a great excuse. If you're a mom or dad, who's not real comfortable in the kitchen, be like, Oh, like I'm going to like have my kids learn to cook. <laughs> it's a great excuse for accidentally learning to cook yourself. Um, and then of course the benefits are just that the whole family is eating better, right? When the family's working together in the kitchen, number one, it's quality time without screens together. A lot of great, great conversation happens in the kitchen. Number two, you're building those life skills for the future. Number three, you're all working together for the present in the family. And, and the last thing is that you're creating actual real food, healthy food. Hopefully you're working with fruits and vegetables. If you're taking my course, you are. Um, no processed foods involved. And, and working with food helps diminish those power struggles at the table, right? That we talked about at the beginning, the hardest part about getting kids to kind of change from standard American diet to a healthier diet is getting them on board. And if they're in involved in the process, they're going to be a lot more likely to take a taste at the table. Um, and there are other kind of parenting strategies for the table too, but starting in the kitchen is going to be your best foundation. Can you talk about uh, what your course includes? So what are people going to learn? What skills are they going to get? Are recipes included? What are you looking at when you're signing up for the course? How long is it? That sort of thing. Yeah, so I mentioned the three levels, little kids, medium sized kids, big kids, and it's all pre-recorded videos. So it's myself and my three older kids, and they each had a friend at the time. So that's kind of, you know, that's a good positive peer pressure. Kids are seeing other kids on the video doing the skills and, and eating healthy food. So they're, they're videos of us in the kitchen showing you what to do. You don't have to have any prior knowledge whatsoever. And we teach over 30 basic skills. So my goal with this course was that by the time kids graduate from the end, that they can tackle any recipe they come across. Okay, so we're teaching skills like peeling, like um, working with dough, rolling it out, like making rice, stovetop and oven safety, of course, knife safety, of course. We have a lot of, um, eight of the 24 videos are knife skills, a couple dull, couple medium and then quite a few in the advanced level are how to cut different things with a chef's knife because that's that's the key to unlocking the produce section right you can you can shop all you want in the produce section but if you don't know how to use a knife all those things are still kind of a mystery to you um, 
and we do include recipes because obviously like if you're gonna have a video of something you got to make something but I also really wanted this course to be allergy friendly so everything is focused on the skills we apply it to a recipe, most of which are allergy friendly, but if any recipe we use doesn't fit someone's dietary needs, they can easily swap out a family favorite recipe that uses the same skill. So for example, we teach flipping and we make some pancakes. Uh, we do make grain-free pancakes actually in the video, but let's say you're sensitive to eggs and we use eggs in our pancakes. You can use any pancake recipe, right? And still get all that flipping practice and the measuring and the stirring and all those things. Um, so again, we do have recipes and they're really good, but they're also easy to swap out because the focus is on the skills. That's awesome. So would you say like a good way to incorporate the program would be maybe to do one or two videos on the weekend with your kids until you've you know, essentially graduated the program? Most definitely. About half of our uh, members are actually homeschoolers, so they're used to curriculum and they're integrating it into their normal class schedule. Um, once a week is perfect. So if you could say, you know, every Saturday afternoon or every Sunday afternoon to do one lesson, there's eight, eight classes at each level. So if you just have a preschooler, you know, you could do eight lessons and expect them to be at the end of that level. And then when they're old enough, they can move into the intermediate level you know, do those eight, wait a few more years and, and move into the advanced. That's awesome. So it can, it can grow with the child. It does. It <laughs> That's does. That's so cool. That's really, really awesome. It's um, just such a great way. It's just such a great activity. If you want something to do with your kids, away, like you said, away from screen time and technology, um, you get them in the kitchen and they're going to be like, how to use this knife. I mean, no kid is going to say no to learning how to use a knife. I highly doubt there's a kid out there that doesn't want to learn. <laughs> right. That's pretty motivating. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm going to teach you how to use this today. That's so cool. So um, we talked a little bit about some fears that people might have or some reservations, but what are, um, what would you say that are some practical tips, ways to um, parent, th that parents can use to get their kids into the kitchen? What are some tools they can use or approach sure. they can take, I guess I would say? Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned it's really motivating for kids to cook for others. So especially if, if your child tends to thrive with like a service attitude, that's definitely something to incorporate into motivating. I mean, ideally, ideally your kids want to get in the kitchen anyway, right? Ideally they're knocking down your door and you just have to get out of their way and make some space. Um, but I think what, what I love about teaching this class intentionally is a couple things. One, it gives the parent an easy thing to do, right? A lot of parents say, I don't really know where to start. Like, I, I don't, I don't know, like I can do this, but I don't know quite how to explain it to my kid or what's appropriate for what age. So I smooth the way for the parent, right? Like I'll do all the thinking for you. I'll do all the hard work for you. You just get to enjoy time with your kids. So once your the kids do one lesson and feel that it's a positive experience with mom and dad, that goes a really long way to motivating everybody to continue doing it as opposed to a stressful experience, which sometimes being in the kitchen together can be. Um, and then uh, once your kids do have a skill, I like to motivate them to help. I mean, because even though my kids are all trained in the kitchen, sometimes when I say, hey, like I need some help in the kitchen, I still get like, oh. <laughs> but if I phrase it like, this, it makes a big difference. If I say, I need someone with peeling skills. Who has peeling skills? Oh, well, the child who lately took that class is like, that's me. That's me. That's mine. I'm coming. Totally different attitude. Totally. Just on the presentation. Just into a different motivation center for mm -hmm. them. Yeah, my husband often uses the, hey, um, can you help me with, like, I need help with this. And then it kind of makes your child feel like they're assisting you and uh, they can bring something to the table. Not like you're telling them to do this. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, can you help me out with this? And uh, so those different ways of sort of figuring out how your kid thinks, like what works for them, that's super smart in terms of rewarding some stuff. I like that. Um, so is there anything, you know, that you, you would want to leave parents with in terms of um, it is possible <laughs> to make it a fun experience or any other tips that you sort of want to leave them with? Most definitely. Um, I would just say, just do it. You know, like we, we do a lot of things that are hard. We make our kids do their homework. We make them take showers. At least mine have to be made to take showers. 
you know, and so we know. I don't know about that- all of you out there, <laughs> but Katie's children take showers. <laughs> yeah, once a week when I force them. Like, <laughs> it's bad over here. But <laughs> the, the point is, we, we know as parents that our kids don't always make the best choices for themselves, right? So that's our job is to guide them into the best choices, even when it's hard. So even if the thought of getting kids in the kitchen or slowing down or giving them sharp knives or letting them use fire, you know, even if all of that is sounds hard to you, that's okay. We were made to do hard things. Parenting is hard. So we just have to realize that it's a long game and it's a long investment. And if we want our kids to be both independent and healthy when they're adults, which I think we would all agree, that's a really good goal. There's no time better than the present to get started, no matter what your kid's age is. Yeah. And and obviously you make it as easy as possible. So a lot of those excuses go out the window because you don't have to really figure it out. Katie said it for you, right? But the motivation, I think, for your kids going away to college, and your kids being able to survive on their own, I think that's huge, you know, um, just little things that you can teach them about, you know, macronutrients and micronutrients and vitamins versus processed foods and all these different things and balancing your meals between proteins and fats and carbohydrates and try to get, you know, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and try to get a vegetable at each meal and those sorts of little tips that you can give them throughout the week, even, even if you're not learning how to cut um, or how to peel or, you know, all these little skills that we need you can just throw those into a conversation, you know, at dinner time when you're sitting down around the table and you're like, I just kind of want to talk about this real quick. What do you see on your plate? You know, how is it balanced? And um, what can you identify? What can you tell me about this? So you can kind of get them involved in learning more about the foods that they're eating. And I know it's been a huge conversation in my house for maybe five years now. And so now Keegan talks about stuff. He'll, he'll say something about, you know, I saw so-and-so eating this and this was my thought about it, you know? Or, or I saw this and I just know it's full of sugar or, you know, whatever it is right? the response is now he has enough information that he can either hold a conversation about it or identify, um, you know, different, different things that we've talked about. And he's, he's getting more to the place where he can identify how different foods make him feel. And so there's just a lot of cool stuff as they age and they, it sort of sinks in. But if you weave it in and out of your conversations, they're really going to absorb it and they'll learn a lot. More than I think we we think. <laughs> yes, for sure. I mean, we start really young talking about like growing foods versus fun foods. You know, mm-hmm. fun foods are the foods that are only really good for your tongue. And <laughs> after you swallow them, they don't really do anything good for you, but they are fun. I and growing that. foods are those foods that make you grow. Yeah, I think that's a Dr. Sears thing, but we've used that for years instead of good food and bad food because I hate to make kids have like that dichotomy about food or you, yeah. kind of this negative thoughts that gets I my seven year old just the last month he's always asking is this healthy which what's healthier the tomato or the cheese and I'm like whoa man like you're really starting to process things and I feel like I really have to lay the groundwork correctly so he has a healthy relationship with food and not one of like you know fear that it's all a balanced scale or something yeah they get so smart so fast and some of the things they that come out of your mouth, you're like, wait, wait, whoa, wait, I gotta make sure this is going down the right track. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know what's healthier, the cheese or the tomato. Right. Like, I have no idea. I don't, I don't know how to answer this. How do you feel when you eat it? <laughs> yeah. Let's not stress about it. <laughs> right? So um, let's talk about your website. So we talked a little bit about your e-course and how people can, um, you know, teach their kids how to cook and it's progressive and you have all these, um, you know, weeks that you can learn all these skills, but I know you also have like some eBooks and some cookbooks and things like that. Right. So can you share what tools you have to kind of continue uh, people and continue to help people on their journey with this? Sure. Well, over at kitchenstewardship.com, that's again, my original blog. So that's where I'm talking to the adults. And there's nine and a half years of blog posts with about research on what's healthy and what's not. And um, just a lot of practical hacks, like here's how you can do this and survive with your sanity intact. Um, So a lot of, yeah, a lot of recipes over there ebooks like the healthy lunchbox to help you figure out how to make lunchbox packing less stressful. Um, I've got better than a box, which is how to take like your old, if you're transitioning from more of a processed foods diet, a lot of times we find that our favorite recipes, we can't like, we can't even remake because they call for a can or a box even in the recipes. So this is how to reinvent those and re-engineer those using all real food. 
I love that. Yeah, the tra the transition part is tough for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we hit a lot of roadblocks, and we really have to be mentally open to the fact that things are going to change, and it's going to be a little bit of a process, and there is certainly a learning curve. I know for, for us, it was a, a long transitional period. I feel like we're still changing. I feel like we yeah. continue to learn, and we continue to make changes and tweak things, and, you know, and your body changes, and, you know, all this kind of stuff throughout your life, and so you kind of just have to be willing to constantly absorb and learn and try new things and and all of that so it is a process for sure so having those little tools is amazing to kind of help you through that transition that's very helpful and again you identified that need and you brought something that will help with it so that's amazing so share um all of your websites uh where can people connect with you um you know how can they get in touch with you and purchase your products and start helping their kids get healthy in the kitchen Sure thing. Well, kidscookrealfood.com is where our e-course is, and you can usually find a little free sample there. Um, kitchenstewardship.com is, again, my blog, and we start, we have an email, so you have a free email course, actually, with our top 10 Monday missions. So if you want to talk about transitioning and baby steps, those are like 10 things you can do one week at a time just to really kind of power pack your first bit of transitioning to real food or supercharge when, if you're in the middle of a transition things that make a big impact. That's awesome. Thanks so much for coming on to the podcast, Katie, and sharing these tips. And I hope a lot of people have been inspired that it is possible to get your kids to not only eat healthy, but to actually help you in the kitchen too, and to become involved and be hands-on so that they can kind of take that into their adulthood as well. And then teach their kids and all their friends, right? Maybe they'll be the only kid at college that can cook their, their own food. <laughs> Can you, I mean, that would be a great uh, way to collect friends and, <laughs> you know. Yeah, hey guys, come over to my dorm or maybe they have an apartment where they actually have a real kitchen. I'm, I'm going to be the host because I know how to actually yeah. cook dinner. I mean, I did not know in college. It was a, it was a learning process for me once I got married, man. So if you can get your kids to do that in college, that's fantastic. That would be amazing. So yeah, for sure. thank you so much for all you do and for all the tools that you provide and thanks for sharing them on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been a pleasure. Let's get those kids in kitchens.